Hi, I'm Rayburn Johnson. And I'm Steve Sensenig. And this is Beyond the Box. Here's your invitation to explore life outside the box of institutional religion. This is a place where there are no walls to restrict our search for truth as we embrace the ambiguity of defining our life in Christ. So unbuckle your seatbelt, recline your chair, throw caution to the wind, and get ready for the ride that is Beyond the the Box. Back to Beyond the Box. Ray, how you doing, buddy? Man, I am doing fine. How about you, brother? I'm doing well, man. Uh, Sweet. We're, we're recording a few bumpers here tonight. Uh, I'm still in Orlando with my family and uh, having a great time, but it's so nice to be able to do this with you. Um, I feel like already I've appeared on the podcast more in 2013 than I did in all of 2012. <laughs> <laughs> well, you uh, it, you weren't exactly twiddling your thumbs in 2012. So uh, no, I let it let it not be thought that you were absent um, because you weren't doing anything else. <laughs> yeah, and you know what, Ray? I, I had a thought. Um, you and I just finished recording bumpers for the uh, Place to Talk episode where we went to visit uh, our friend Josh McDowell down in Hickory. And uh, I did think about this, that, you know, our podcast listeners might not know necessarily uh, that I and my family are mobile now. We're living in a motor home and traveling uh, really around the U.S. uh, and having a great time doing it. Uh, I'm scheduling concerts uh, in different parts of the country and stuff. Uh, But thinking of going to a place to talk makes me think that, you know, if there are other listeners who have similar uh, environments like Josh's or uh, similar groups that get together and, and have dialogue. And uh, you know uh, that you'd like to have me come and, and talk with you guys as well. Um, just drop me a note and let me know. And if I'm in your part of the country, I'd love to to uh, stop in or just have coffee with a listener or whatever. So very, very uh, cool. don't be afraid to, to give me a shout out on Facebook or on the website and say, hey, Steve, are you coming to my part of the country? Um, because I, I enjoy that very much. I had a chance, uh, we were out in Los Angeles, um, in the early part of December, uh, when we first moved into our motor home, we had to pick it up on the other side of the continent and drive it back and got a chance to sit down and have coffee with Preston Sprinkle, who we had interviewed on the podcast uh, a couple years ago. And, uh, I, I enjoy doing that kind of thing. So, uh, please feel free if you're listening and, and you'd love to meet up in person sometime for coffee or with a group of people, just let me know. Very cool. Um, but speaking of group discussions, right, <laughs> we had a fantastic discussion uh, on our Facebook group recently uh, about the topic of Satan. And you know, Steve, this has been a recurring topic. This is something mm-hmm. that I, I've noticed that um, next to nonviolence, probably yeah. the existence or non-existence of the devil has been probably the second most talked about thing on our Facebook page. The thing that yeah. either people continually post questions about or mm-hmm. have conversation about on there. Well, and it was so ironic because I had, had been coming through your area uh, not too long before this latest discussion uh, came about. And you and I had lunch together along with Dylan, uh, my son, uh, who's our producer. And... Uh, Ironically enough, you and I discussed this very topic. Yeah, that's over a hot lunch. topic. <laughs> and, and then, you know, like, I don't know, a week later it came up on Facebook. And uh, But this particular thread on Facebook traveled very fast and very uh, lengthily uh, in a short amount of time. And uh, there were some great questions raised. And somebody, I think it was Judy Gale, had a suggestion of a roundtable discussion um, with you and Brad Jerzak and Michael Harden um, discussing this topic and, and bringing their unique perspectives to it. Um, it because it, it is, it, it's one of those things that we don't really, at least in my experience, it, I didn't even begin to question for the longest time. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You and I, Ray, have traveled uh, an interesting journey of questioning a lot of things. And uh, for some reason to me, the topic of Satan and the identity of or the existence, non-existence of Satan never really came into play for the longest time. And then all of a sudden I began to think about it and I thought, wait a minute, 
all these other shifts that I've had in my theology, how does this affect my view of Satan? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I know for myself, a lot of this, uh, a lot of the questioning of what is the devil or who is the devil or all of that kind of thing, mm-hmm. um, what is the satanic principle, all these kinds of things started right. uh, coming to the surface when I started reading a lot on mimetic theory um, uh-huh. about a year and a half ago. And I kept coming across this term, the Satan, with the, the, Satan. With mm-hmm. the article in front the of article. it, the yeah. Satan. And um, I know Michael Harden and I talked about that about a year and a half ago, a mm-hmm. little bit. He just made a brief mention and an explosion happened on our <laughs> Facebook page of conversation in, on that particular podcast episode. It was as if no one heard anything else we said in the podcast, <laughs> right. but this one little sentence about the devil. <laughs> and um, so it, it's, you know, this has been something that's been stirring in me for a while. And uh, when Judy suggested that um, I get Michael and Brad to weigh in on the conversation, which they, which was great that they did on Facebook. It was wonderful. Yeah, they weighed in there too. But I tell you, um, this episode is going to, this is going to knock your socks off. Um, mm-hmm. I think people are really, I told my wife a little while ago, I can't wait to see the response <laughs> that we get to this episode because <laughs> some of the things that are said in this episode um Let me just say, Michael Harden does not mince words. And (laughs) if you, if you never knew anything about Michael Harden, you'll quickly learn (laughs) that man does not mince words. And I Mm. so appreciate that because, you know, me as a uh, proper Southern gentleman have a tendency to beat around the bush sometimes, but he says exactly what I think and what I wish I would just come out and say. <laughs> yeah. well, and, and you know what, Ray? It's interesting because one of the things that I've come to really appreciate about Michael since uh, meeting him through the podcast, uh, and I've, I've never had the opportunity like you to, to really converse with Michael directly or to, or to meet him in person, but listening to him and talking to you and uh, reading his comments on Facebook and everything, one of the things I've come to really appreciate about Michael is that there there almost seems to be a sense of let's just cut to the chase. Let's, let's yeah. just, you know, get, uh, like you said, let's not beat around the bush because I, I think I, I'm certainly putting words in Michael's mouth here and I don't mean to, but um, it, it comes across to me as this is so important that mm-hmm. we have these conversations and that we talk about these topics and that we rethink these things and that we don't just relax in the way it's always been or the way we've always been taught about it that it's so it's like a passion for him that that causes him just to to drive right to the core of the issue and say you know let's just rip that band-aid off real quick you know yeah. and and I like that I well, it's I not you, necessarily I, my style all, uh, always either but I like the fact that people can be that passionate about something that they just want to get right to the heart of it and and address the core issue well I'll tell you uh, Michael and Brad are two of my favorite people and two of my favorite theologians on planet mm-hmm. earth walking around right now. And <laughs> those guys are such a dynamic duo. Um, <laughs> when you put the two of them together, mm-hmm. uh, which I first saw in the book stricken by God, they co-edited that book. And that book was uh-huh. simply amazing on nonviolent atonement. Mm-hmm. And um, then at the wild goose and getting to sit with these guys for several days and just talk theology, the way they um, reverberate, ideas off of each other and use each other as a sounding board. Um, I just consider it a privilege to get to sit there and take it in. Mm-hmm. Um, I tell you, it's like, it's like having Batman and Batman. I mean, you know, <laughs> there's no Robin there. It's so just Robin. Batman and <laughs> Batman, you know? So this, this conversation, um, I feel like, I feel like there was so, there was so much that Brad brought to the conversation and there was mm-hmm. so much that Michael brought to the conversation that they just have a way of so complimenting each other. Um, yeah. I think you guys are really, really going to enjoy this one. If you've been wondering who the devil is, what the devil is, is there a devil? Um, what <laughs> what about evil? All of the questions that you guys... Mm-hmm. Well, here, here's basically the format we did. I went through both Facebook posts that had mm-hmm. uh, all of those comments. And I went through and wrote down every question um, mm, throughout the entire comment stream. Yeah. And if, if your question wasn't directly addressed in this podcast, I asked it for you. Mm. Um, so I tried to make sure that everybody's, I couldn't get to absolutely every question, but I would say about 95% of the questions that came in, 
if um, if it wasn't posed directly in the podcast by me, it's simply because I felt like Michael and Brad had already already covered it and already answered it sufficiently. Mm-hmm. So I think you're really going to enjoy this. They're thinking out loud on a lot of this, but um, <laughs> I tell you, they're they're way farther along on having a solid answer than I've been. Um, yeah. And as Brad says continually through this podcast. It's actually much worse than you think it is. <laughs> You'll get that in a little while, folks. <laughs> so without further ado, right, Steve. So here's Rayburn, Brad, and Michael. Well, welcome one and all to Beyond the Box. Man, I'm really excited about what we have in store for you today. This is one of the first. I mean, we've done a few things that are kind of listener demanded, but I have to say this is probably the first direct response listener demanded conversation that I can remember having on the podcast when it includes other guests. So today I am ecstatic to be joined by my good friends, Michael Harden and Brad Jerzak. Guys, welcome back to the podcast. Great to have you here. Nice thank to you. be here. Um, guys, thank you so much for taking the time, not only to interact on the Facebook page, but also to do this episode because this is a topic that is a really, really big conversation that's been ongoing on our podcast, especially on our Facebook page. And so I think this is really going to help a lot of people out. I know I'm looking forward to it. Um, I want to just establish a few things off, off the, off the cuff. Um, A lot of guys that listen to the podcast, um, they know you, Michael and you, Brad as scholars, but, Sometimes they don't have some of the background (laughs) and Michael is pointing to himself saying, who me? (laughs) Yes, you. I don't care what Christianity today says, Michael, (laughs) whatever Christianity today says that doesn't apply here. (laughs) Um, But you guys, you guys are scholars, but I tell you, as I've hung out with you over the last bit, I've realized that y'all, y'all are scholars. You love Jesus, but you also have pastoral experience with actual people. And when I say pastoral experience, I'm not just talking about getting up and preaching on a Sunday. I'm not talking about that at all, but actually interacting with people. Um, some of these, some of these things that we know is demonic possession or dealing with demons. You guys have, have had firsthand experience with this. So I don't want people to think that we're just going to have an ivory tower conversation that's been heavily influenced by Western rationalistic thinking and has nothing to do with real world people. So I, I just want people to understand that you guys have hearts for Jesus and that you love people and that you've dealt with this stuff. With that said, we're going to try and get to a lot of questions tonight that were brought up on the Facebook page. And I'm going to just throw these out there and uh, I'm going to let you guys just kind of bat them back and forth. And I, I'm just going to be referee. <laughs> so the first thing I'd like to do before we get into the questions is let's talk a little bit about the history of Satan. And Michael, you were the first one that really, I heard use the term the Satan, um, to, to put the article in front of it. I had never heard that before. So can you talk a little bit about the Satan and maybe the history of how we got to what we believe in the West about the devil? I mean, it's, it's pretty basic. Um, but, but, but really what it involves is more, a more critical approach to Scripture. If you're a conservative evangelical, a God said it, I believe it, that settles it. What I'm about to say won't work for you. But if you're willing to approach Scripture even a little bit critically, and you're willing to recognize that most of the um, uh, Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament, was written in, around, and after the exile, um, there's already the influence of Zoroastrianism, which is a, a Persian uh, religion um, that's very dualist or, or, or uh, uh, two-sided in character. It believes in an eternal principle of good and an eternal principle of evil. And so um, Judaism becomes influenced by this um, notion, but because uh, as, as we're moving through the exile and into the post exile period, Judaism is moving from what we call henotheism, a belief in many gods, to monotheism, a belief in one god. One of the things that has to happen is that as this business of the devil is, first of all, in the henotheistic sphere, in the sphere where there are many gods, the devil's part of the council of the gods. 
the many gods. And we see this in the introduction to the book of Job. And the devil runs around heaven like some prosecuting attorney. And, you know, he's kind of like God's right-hand guy making sure everybody behaves. He's like Santa Claus. He knows if you've been naughty, knows if you've been nice kind of thing, you know. And, and he rats you out, you know. And if he doesn't like you, he really rats you out. And, but he's still he's working for God. And so that's what the Satan's still part of this thing in this henotheistic sphere. As we move toward monotheism as, as after the re, uh, reforms of Josiah, um, Satan can no longer occupy that place. Uh, the devil has to have another place. And uh, so as you move into this developing uh, monotheistic picture, um, within a few centuries of the exile, there emerges a view that the Satan was uh, an angelic being that uh, rebelled uh, with a number of lieutenants. They fell to the earth, um, or they were thrown out of heaven, I should say, and uh, they were put, put into Sheol, all but 10%. Now, 10% were allowed to roam the earth because they begged and said, look, don't throw all of us in prison, God. That wouldn't be right. Let 10% of us remain behind. And you can find all of this in the, in the book of First Enoch, which is um, uh, the book of the Watchers at any rate, which is written about 200 years before Jesus, the first part of First Enoch. And um, so the Satan uh, goes from being um, the, the, uh, the devil, uh, this devil figure to uh, this, this kind of evil principle to the Satan, Hashatan, uh, which is the prosecuting attorney to now this fallen angel. And then as we move into the Middle Ages, of course, um, the Satan becomes the leader of hell. He kind of is the um, a governor, uh, as, as it were, of the underworld. And, uh, and you move to, to, by the time you get to the Reformation, uh, the Satan has become a figure that's very interactive in human history, at least as interactive, if, if not more interactive than God. And then, then thankfully, uh, in the 1800s, um, science begins to challenge all of this notion of um, uh, demons in shadows, you know, and, and demons behind every bush. And in fact, there were rabbis in Jesus' day that taught that if you walked, if you walked in a shadow, you could be possessed by a demon. I mean, wow. there's so much superstition attached to this that the modern scientific mindset has now uh, done away with all of this. But but then part of the problem in that is that, okay, so we've explained away the mythological aspects of the Satan, but how do we then account for real evil in the world? What is this language about? And is is the Bible, in fact, using this language to point to something very, very real, very genuine, very powerful, and how do we understand that? Mm, mm. So let so let's talk about the the terms here. Um, one of the things that we were talking about before we started this discussion was it's really important to define our terms. So from the, what I under, understand, Michael, Satan just actually means adversary. Is that right? Right. Okay. So we're, we've got this idea early on that now when we say when we say that this started was this something that. Um, for instance, in the book of Job, was this something that the Jews were inheriting from the cultures surrounding them? Or was this kind of a unique idea that Satan was part of the council of the gods and this kind of thing? Well, again, with Zoroaster, with Zoroaster, um, Zoroaster is a, an incredible prophet um, that is really trying to critique the sacrificial cult in Persia at that time. And he's so in order for him to be able to work his thinking out, he sets up two eternal principles. Um, and one of those principles is evil, that in that evil has a name. I believe the name is Ahiram. And then the good, the good God has a name as well. See, it's kind of a, it's Manichaeism before Manichae, you know. Um, uh, with Judaism, Judaism takes it over and talks about Hashatan. Hashatan means the accuser, not, not so much the adversary, but the accuser. And this is important because it's not that the devil's just our enemy. It's that it's that the, the function of the Satan is to accuse us, mm. to point fingers at us, to blame us, to, to say, that that's the guy. Mm. You know, that's the role of the Satan is to point the finger. Mm. Mm. Um, and that's what Hashatan means. Um, Diabolos is just going to be a Greek uh, term used 
uh, for uh, Hashatan that, that we'll get the word diabolical or, or devil, devil. And uh, and then of course by the you know by the Middle Ages, um, because Satan is a um, a fallen angel that can masquerade as an angel of light. He's called Lucifer, which means light bearer. But the only person called Lucifer in the New Testament is Jesus. In the book of the Revelation, Jesus is Lucifer. The bright the morning star, bearer. right? And that, and that where yeah. that comes from? Yeah. And then, of course, by the time you get to the Enlightenment, the devil now becomes Mephistopheles. Huh. Huh. And this this kind of sage, sage figure that, that questions and queries and Huh. Interesting. So uh, just just to kind of recapitulate for our listeners so that they're kind of understanding, we have this evolution of the idea of the devil that goes from maybe being almost almost a part of the Godhead, the accusatory yeah. part of the Godhead, to then by the year 200 BC or so with the Book of Enoch, he, he kind of is separated off from from at least the Council of the Gods or however you'd want to say it. He's separated off and looked at as kind of a separate figure that's kind of opposed to God. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. So let me. Can yeah, I jump in absolutely. there too? I, I want to problematize some of it too with, with Michael. Um, so, uh, in addition to what Michael said, we, th- there's there's some things that make it problematic in terms of even how he's answered it. With, and I would I would be in alignment with how he's answered it. Here's, the, here's some honest problems. Uh, one is uh, the actual writings of Zoroaster. We just have quite late. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't remember what century we finally right. find them. So, so e- even in terms of what Zohar, Zoroaster mm-hmm. actually taught and then how that got into the Jewish thinking, you know, we are speculating a bit. Right, right. Um, a second problem is... Uh, the question of, uh, you know, how seriously should we as Christians take the book of Enoch um, and how seriously did Jesus take the books of Enoch and the Watchers, um, I would be quite inclined to to uh, to say that the Jews were heavily influenced by the book of Enoch, the second temple Jews, but that doesn't mean Jesus bought in, and a lot of people assume that he did. Nevertheless, you have the book of Jude in our New Testament, you know, quoting Enoch. And so that tells you it had the, the, the sort of this Enoch tradition did have an impact even on the, uh, the apostolic era. Um, I also want to say that so much of our idea of, you know, the, our classic idea of the devil being an, a fallen angel, it, just biblically speaking, is like super thin. Uh, we've yeah. got, we've got a in terms of, in terms of biblical mythology. Even uh, we we lean so heavily on a couple verses from Isaiah and Ezekiel, wherein Isaiah and Ezekiel actually tell us who they're addressing, and it's like local kings. Yes, um, the, you know the king of Tyre. He says I'm talking to the king of Tyre, and we say, well, he couldn't be talking to the king of Tyre because he's acting as if he's godlike. It's like. Exactly. That's what kings thought back then, you know. <laughs> That's right. Um, There's your problem. Then, yeah, and then and but but on top of that, mm-hmm. um, you know, we probably or we may not have always just simply assumed that the dragon equals the serpent equals the devil equals Satan and all of that, except that what you get in Revelation chapter twelve, the author just completely conflates yeah. them. I'll read you the oh, yeah. I'll read you this. Um, uh, Then war broke out in heaven, verse 7. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the world astray. So you get the whole mythology boiled down into three verses of Revelation. And I do want to say that um, he... If 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 we're gonna really take that super literally, then um, the, then it seems to me uh, our theology has been off anyways because we've associated this with some time before creation when in fact um, John is pointing to the crucifixion, you know. So 
uh, I, maybe Michael could address some of these, these let, points. Let me let me just uh, throw sure. in a parenthetical thought here, Brad, because this sounds so much like I don't know if you'll recall um, the episode we did a year ago or so on her gates will never be shut, or a year and a half ago, I guess it's been now. Her gates will never be shut, and you talked about the two um, the the two traditions of Gehenna, the Jeremiah tradition and the Enoch tradition. And if I'm hearing you right, you're basically saying that that's kind of the same argument that it didn't it, it doesn't just apply to Gehenna, but it also applies to even what the mm-hmm. Satan or who the Satan is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That there's that Enoch tradition that takes over Judaism, so that Second Temple Judaism gets steeped in this idea of of Satan as an entity or a person. But then you're saying, if I'm hearing you right, that Jesus, just as he did with the with Gehenna, follows the Jeremiah mm-hmm. tradition. So he does the same with the idea of the Satan. Am I, is that right? Um, may, maybe. Like I, I think that there is a question of how much Jesus does actually incorporate the Enoch tradition. I'm I'm saying don't assume he does. But on the other hand, he he may be fine to to use that language for his purposes in addressing the problem of evil. Um, I don't know. Well, I I think you're right. Um, f- first of all, one thing we know about Jesus is that whenever he uses the language of his interlocutors, he always subverts it. So he'll subvert rabbinic language, he will subvert Essene language, he will subvert Samaritan language, he will subvert Sadducean language, he, and so he will subvert apocalyptic language as well. I mean, the parables are subversive speech, as William Herzog puts it. I mean, G- Jesus, just because Jesus uses categories from from these various groups or various interpretive methods hermeneutics in this culture doesn't mean he he accepts them lock stock and barrel so i think you're absolutely right there Hmm. um that first enoch had a huge influence on the early church i have no doubt i mean i you see it of course as you pointed out in the book of the revelation you see it in jude i think you see it all over the gospel of matthew i think the writer to matthew is essentially writing the gospel story as an anti-watcher tale. Uh, oh. There was an interesting book that was just published uh, by Whippenstock and I, I, on Enoch and Matthew that, that to me was a, a fascinating look at particularly the birth narratives in light of the Enoch um, mythology. But whether or not Enoch had that kind of role in Jesus' life, I agree with you. I don't think we can say one way or the other. And, and if it did, he certainly wasn't looking at it as somehow sacred text because I don't think he had a, he had a view of sacred texts like we think um, uh, he needed to have in order to be the Son of God kind of thing. Second, I'm going to agree with you about the Zoroaster thing. We are, of course, looking at a lot of, of late dating of things, but one could, the same thing could be said about Socrates and Plato. The manuscript traditions that we have of them come yeah. from the late Middle Ages, you know. Um, so so I'm, I'm comfortable enough to, to at least see uh, the influence of that dualistic thinking entering um, Jewish culture certainly uh, by the year 500, 400, you know BCE. Uh, I'm okay with that uh, in terms of the history of ideas. What do you make of the Revelation 12 passage? I don't. I don't bother with Revelation, Brad. I leave that to people like you that are willing to f- fry their brains. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm. You know, I, I, I'm one of those people that's fairly convinced that if I could redo the New Testament, I'd put Revelation as the first book of the New Testament. I, I see it kind of as an abortive attempt to talk about Christ. Uh, it's still locked into the vengeful God stuff. And so I think it's an abortive attempt. And I, I would put Matthew after Revelation as another attempt that tries to get there but doesn't succeed. Then I would put Mark, Luke, John, Paul, etc. And, you know, and, and Michael, this is whole, where, this, this is, I know, beyond the scope of our conversation, but um, this is where there's some people listening to our podcast right now that haven't tuned in for the last four years to see where we've been going and their their brains are just fried right now. <laughs> the idea that you know that that you're messing with the quote unquote canon. So I'm just going to yeah. put a plug in right here and say, folks, you need to go get the Jesus driven life. <laughs> Find out how Jesus read the Bible, and we need to we need to have a complete re understanding from the old worn out evangelical idea of inerrancy and and infallibility, and uh, really look at the text the way you know, we're saying we think it was written. 
And I, and I would argue that the Jesus Driven Life is an example of a book where uh, scholars like Michael are actually taking the Bible more seriously, reading it more carefully, um, uh, paying closer attention to the genres and, and all of that. And, and absolutely, uh, there, there's a, well, I don't know if Michael are, and I are on the same page in everything, but uh, c certainly I, I, I would I see him honoring the inspiration of scripture in this other sense, right? And so, um, but, but, but bottom line too is let's read the Bible with Jesus as our rabbi. Well, I, yeah. Now, like we did with, when we were doing Stricken by God and we did all the atonement issues, one yeah. of the things we realized was that if you start to unravel the, if, if atonement is like a carpet, you know, and you start unraveling the threads, all of a sudden, all the threads of all these other doctrines, the doctrine of the Trinity, Christology, history, faith, Christian life, discipleship, ecclesiology, the end times, they're all woven in. And then we, we discovered the same thing when we did, um, well, when you wrote, you wrote her gates will never be shut, and I edited Compassion and Eschatology, and then we both participated in Hellbound. Once you, once you start unraveling this hell thing, why all these other doctrines get affected. And it's the same thing with this business of the devil. Hmm. Once you start unraveling this business of the Satan, it affects every other doctrine you've got. Your doctrine of God, the question of theodicy becomes a whole new ballgame. Yep. Evil, anthropology, what it means to be human in our relationship to evil. It, it, it enter, you enter into psychology, it enters into... The question of, of atonement, it, what, it enters into eschatology. It enters into, uh, if we were to, to include now folks like Walter Wink and others, it enters into the structures of human culture and society. I mean, it, to, once you start pulling at these threads in an on, with an honest intent to really listen and learn, everything unravels that we've known. And for me, that's okay. I think that this old, tired rug we call Christianity needs to be unwoven and remade. Well, I, I, let me just say, um, as someone who has been going down this journey, and, and I'm arriving, I've been arriving as of late, the places that you guys have been for a while. Um, so I, I'm kind of fresh on this journey from, you know, conservative evangelicalism and inerrancy to, to w what we're talking about today. And the thing that has really stricken me in the last couple of years, no pun intended, sorry, the whole stricken by God <laughs> thing, sorry. But uh, the the thing that is that is really uh, hit me, uh, oh, some GR Deli chocolate, now we're talking. <laughs> the thing that's really hit me besides Michael's GR Deli chocolate is um, the fact that what you guys are saying is Jesus focused. That what we've done in the evangelical church is we've elevated the scripture to this place where Jesus himself has to bow the knee to it instead of scripture bowing the knee to Jesus. And what right. you're saying by by using Jesus as our hermeneutic, where he's our interpretive lens through which we view scripture, then all of a sudden when whoever it is, whatever biblical author begins to disagree with the image of God we see in Jesus, we've got to put them under the microscope just like we do anything else. You can take that one step further. If we've elevated scripture of Jesus, the moment we use scripture to point to somebody, the moment we become Bible thumpers, the moment we say, you're in sin because the Bible says, we have become the Satan, we've become the accuser. Mm. In other words, we're using scripture satanically at that point. Wow. Wow. Selah. Selah. My goodness. You should say that in a movie. Oh, you already did. That was awesome. <laughs> and, and for and I mean, for the, really, right? for those no, who don't say, know, I didn't say that in Hellbound. Let Let me just put another plug. I'm going to be the plug boy today. I'm I'm a walking, living, breathing commercial. Uh, Hellbound is going to come out. I think on DVD in April. Is that right, guys? May May, May okay. 28th. May 28th. Um, guys, if you've not seen Hellbound yet, you got to get on Amazon or wherever you purchase your DVDs and pick that one up. Michael's on it. Brad's on it. There's a plethora of other people on it deconstructing the idea of hell. But what you just said, Michael, and that being in the movie, see, that's what you're saying is really convicting to me because I found myself 
elevating some of the teachings of Scripture to a place where I no longer act like Jesus. And that becomes mm-hmm. problematic. I use Scripture to become the Satan. Hmm. Isn't that's that, right. I mean, that's, that's just right. shocking. It's shocking. It, and, well, well, let's let's look wow. at what Matthew 4 with the temptation narrative, which a lot of yep. people have been asking about. Isn't that what Satan, the, the Satan did in this instance, is he uses Scripture, the very thing that they had been searching for salvation in, and he uses it to subvert the mission of Jesus. <laughs> or it, or whatever. We're going to talk about that, but whatever it is subverts the message of Jesus. I, I'm going to go out on a limb, and uh, oh, don't, well. saw it, don't saw it <laughs> off now. I, 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 would, I would say that pastors and churches that use the Bible as a a bully pulpit, as a, um, as a weapon, as a, an accusatory instrument. Those churches are the very ones that accuse others of being filled with the devil and being satanic. What they're really doing is projecting their own stuff out. They are the devil. They are the Satan. Mm. And the fact is, one could say that there are whole chunks or types of Christianity that are Satan-possessed. Possessed by this need to accuse, this need to create the enemy, this need to make the other other. My goodness. My goodness. Selah. I, I just, you know what? Right there, right there, I'm sorry, but I've got to add, uh, i got to add a few crickets. Right there. Come on, crickets. <laughs> I'm waiting for you. Oh, there we go. <laughs> we need a little moment of silence there. <laughs> Michael, I tell you, that is a... Guys, that's a complete reconstitution of what it even means to follow Jesus. Because what we've been taught is that it means a slavish obedience to these 66 books that can end up causing us to completely miss what Jesus was all about in his ministry to prostitutes and tax collectors and all the outcasts and all the people that were being accused by the religious establishment. Yeah. Hmm. Well, it, it, it also makes it also you know, end up making God into the devil. Hmm. You know, it, if if God is the, the 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 punishing judge with the list of wrongdoings that he's you know going to torment you with, then then um, or or that he's he's actually elected some for that purpose to the praise of his glory. Hallelujah. Uh, <laughs> you know, ju- um, I, I'll, I'll let John Wesley speak for me. He he said the God of Calvin is worse than the devil. Mm. Oh yeah. <laughs> so Amen. so I mean that's about a, that's a projection and and okay so maybe even maybe maybe uh, that's not fair to Calvin somehow and so on. But but that's what that's the warning I'm hearing for me. Mm. Don't become the accuser. I mean, in a sense, you're hooked into it. We're doing it right now, kind of, aren't we? <laughs> you know, we, so you get you, you get hooked into this thing of being the accuser, but then also projecting that on God in your own image now is the is the uber accuser. Mm. Wow. Well, wow. I think there's a difference between naming something truthfully and accusing. Um, if I'm accusing you, what I'm really looking is to get you condemned. Um, I'm not looking to do that with the evangelicals or the fundamentalists that, that I think are acting in a satanic fashion because I believe that God loves them mm. um, and just as he loves any of the rest of us. And um, my hope is that they would recognize that in their use of Scripture, in the way they um, uh, have appropriated the Bible, that they are in fact functioning that way and they repent. You know, I mean, I, I would love to see someone like Mark Driscoll repent. Mm. That would be such a blessing to the church, mm. you know. Um, wow. wow. So, so, guys, uh, Michael, in the midst of this, you mentioned um, you mentioned Satan as an anthropological reality. And I think this is kind of the key to a lot of the questions that we've got that we, that we want to cover tonight. Um, can you tell us what you mean when you – we're throwing around a lot of $4 words – when you say that Satan is an anthropological reality or phenomenon or however you want to say it, can you define that for us? Uh, yeah, very simply, um, the devil is not a creature that God made. We, we humans have created the Satan. The Satan is who we are. The Satan is our spiritual dark side um, that has become 
uncoupled from our control. And um, now, uh, in, in, if I can use this word, haunts us. Can, can, can you say that again, Michael? We um, lost the connection there for a second. Or there's honest to goodness dark side. So, so the so the Satan is you're, you're saying the Satan is basically bound up in us that that it's if I heard you right because like I said we lost the connection there for a moment that's the gist of it. Okay. We, we generate it. We generate yeah. it. Mm-hmm. So, for example, like um, <laughs> this was a this was crazy when my uh, when my when my youngest son was just a like nine years old. One day he said to me out of the blue, "Hey, Dad." Uh, demons aren't fallen angels. And I'm like, pardon? <laughs> and at that time, I, I thought that's what they were. But I also knew the Bible never once says that. And so um, so I'm like, okay, so so, uh, who told you that? And, and he said, well, Jesus did. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so uh, so then what are, uh, what are, what are, fall- what are demons then? And, and then he said, well, Jesus told me that demons, now this is a nine-year-old from the hip, out of prayer time. He said, uh, Jesus told me that demons are created by people out of the ashes of war, out of the things that they desire that don't belong to them, and out of the tears that are of th- when they're afraid. Sweet. And then, And then he says, and then... So we create the demons out of those things, and then he says, and then they take on a life of their own and turn on you and begin to torment you. And I'm, I mean, the hair on my head oh, stood goodness. up because, like, it, there were so many things that he was saying that were coming into alignment, things we've heard from Michael and from Wayne Kid, things that, that made sense of our lives. And, and so on the one hand, we are saying it's anthropological, but we're also saying it is reality. And if you have any experience with addictions, and with the the voices that come through addictions to torment you out of out of the abusive substances that we have generated these demons, so that when the world speaks about you know so and so you know Robert Downey Jr. is really wrestling with his demons, I think they've got it right. Wow. Well, that, that, that's true. That's true. And I I would take it one step further. Um, yeah. That um, demons. Manifest in psychological and, and psychosocial um, uh, phenomenon. They manifest as addictions. They manifest as rage. They manifest as um, uh, uh, violence. Um, but they also are. There's also a spiritual component to them. Um, and just as we humans are. Um, uh, God takes us in the beginning and takes the Adam Adama the clay and breathes the Ruach, and we become a living nefesh, a living being. Um, just as, the, so, so too, the demonic for us also has a spiritual component, a spiritual side. Um, and that's the, that's the part, I think, that people, that people wrestle with when they hear us talking about the devil as addictions, as phenomenons of, of violence or structures of violence, institutional structures that, that, that debilitate and destroy. They go, oh, they've westernized this, they've psychologized this. And, and Brad and I aren't saying that at all. We're reckoning with the fact that, that what we have created as humans also has a spiritual side, a dark side, hmm. that is decoupled from us. Yes. And and can and like Brad's sons, and that by the way was the best definition I've ever heard hmm. of the demonic. Just a brilliant definition. Hmm. Out of the mouths of babes, right? Yeah. Yeah. It just so, yep. yeah. So so it it comes back and bites us in a thousand different ways. Yeah. Um and, and in fact, you know, when you see the, the interesting thing is when we talk about the devil is that the way a, a, a person in an African tribe manifests the satanic is going to be different than the way a person sitting on a Freudian doctor's couch is going to manifest it. We manifest the Satan according to our culture. Hmm. Okay? So that if, if I believe in, in demons around every bush and that if I'm possessed I'm going to speak in in uh, weird languages and things, 
all I'm really saying is that I can access what Jung calls the collective human consciousness, or what I would call in the language of the Native American tradition that I engage, the spirit world. So it's no surprise to me that there are certain times and places where people can manifest stuff that is completely impossible for them to have known beforehand, but, but we're all interconnected. You see, and this is another piece of this. We have to redefine our anthropology. Mm. If we're all interconnected, so that, you know, Brad, there's no such thing as Brad Jurzak or Michael Harden, but there is the Brad-Michael relationship. That's what's real, well, and, and, is the Brad-Michael, Michael Ray, Ray-Brad relation. Those are the realities. And Michael, isn't yeah. that isn't that kind of something that is a real Girardian thing, the interdivisual? Isn't that kind of... Yeah, it's not just Rene, though. Okay. I mean, the, the turn to relationality is something that's been occurring for 200 years in literature, in psychology, in physics. You know, we've moved away from the, from the notion of, of atoms as independent entities to quantum physics where everything is yeah. interrelated. Yeah. And we've done the same thing in, in so many disciplines. It's not just Rene. Rene coined the term interdividual. But this is a huge shift. And what this means is this means if we're all connected, that there's kind of like a human internet, as it were, hmm. and that that on levels beyond our conscious ability, that it can be tapped into. Hmm. And it can be tapped into for good, and it can be tapped into for evil. Hmm. And I, I, that's all I'm really trying to say, and that's why a person on a... I'm sorry, go ahead, Brad. I was just going to say, too, the, the, you know, I, I've experimented with this a little bit to see... Uh, how much um, uh, we're dealing just with different reality, or no, the same reality with different cultures. And what I've seen is there's there, 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 there is tremendous sameness, and there's also some specific difference. So, for yeah. example, um, uh, what I've noticed is if you, quite often, if you treat something as a, as a demon, it'll act like a demon. If you treat mm -hmm. something as a dissociative part of a human psyche, it'll act like that. If you treat That's it right. as as a shadow to to be expelled that it needs to, you know you do that but if you treat it as as a shadow side to be embraced it acts like that so to some degree um, the counselor or the deliverance minister actually imposes a framework over the person wow. and then um, and, and I'm not saying that's even bad it's like that's why all of those things can kind of work sometimes but I, I also have seen differentiation too so for example um, I, I've worked with a number of people uh, where psychologists or their professional psychiatrists, medical physicians, not not Christian, had diagnosed um, uh, uh, dissociative identity disorder, mm -hmm. and then set, uh, sent the folks to us to, to work with them. Um, I was part of a, a counseling team that was working with these folks for a while, and 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 they would differentiate. Uh, parts of themselves with demonic parts that they would call the dark ones or something. And so some of these things, you absolutely could not cast them out. You had to integrate them. And then other things, you really did need to send it away, not welcome it and embrace it. I don't understand all of that. Um, but, uh, you know, in terms of if, if your listeners are interested in, in you know, ha have we encountered these things or are we just, you know, speaking from a, a, a university somewhere? It's like, no, no, I... I've seen, I've seen the good and bad fruit of of, of sort of exorcism style stuff with thousands and thousands, yeah, probably thousands of demons. Yeah, Brad, Brad, didn't you say before we started podcasting that you've actually been personally involved in probably a thousand or two thousand exorcisms yourself? Yeah, well, I'm um, not that many exorcisms, but some of the exorcisms in, in, in involved hundreds of demons, you mm -hmm. know. And so, so what does that mean, though? Well, one day a, a friend came to my door and he said, um, "I have a message from God for you." Now I trusted this guy; he's not he's not wacky or anything, and I take him really seriously. I said, "Okay, what's your message?" And he said, um, "God wants you to stop going through the deliverance door. Uh, if you will go through the inner healing door instead, your authority of, over demons will go through the roof." <laughs> wow. Not and, and it's because we were taking the axe to the root of the trees to repentance, dealing with the person's issues, and then the demonic would just it would be more like it would dissolve. The importance of that also was 
uh, in the deliverance style ministry I was doing, it was like absolutely going to my head the way it did for the disciples, right? Because even the demons obeyed me, right? And then on the other hand, I was doing have to, having to do all sorts of inner healing work on people who were abused by exorcists, you know, traumatized, mm -hmm. yelled at as if they were demons and stuff. And so, so I just completely started, you know, right, uh, working in the inner healing side of things. It got much gentler, much kinder, and actually more effective. So, so let me ask you guys. Oh, I have, yeah. Deborah on the Facebook page says. How would Brad and Michael define supernatural? So from what I'm hearing you say, guys, it's this idea of the interdividual, that, that, that the supernatural element is the transcendent human connectivity. Is that right? Well, first of all, I don't believe in the supernatural. Mm, mm. I mean, what I, what I, and what I mean by that is... I don't divide the world into the natural and the supernatural. Mm, that's good. It's all one great big connected universe that's for me. Good. Um, and, and I think you can you can see this on a on a quantum level. I mean, we 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 recognize that there are just things out there in the quantum world that are just they they can't be explained. Mathematical formula don't work, you know. And we're still learning. We're still in the process of learning uh, about that world. We see it in psychology. I mean, psychology is an infant discipline. It's really only a little more than 100 years old. Mm, mm. And look at all the models we've already been through of what the human mind is about. And we're finally just coming to the place where we're connecting the mind and the brain. Mm. So the cognitive science, you know, I mean, we we are, the, the, the notion that there's a supernatural and a natural and God's in the supernatural world and humans are in the natural world. Uh, uh. Isn't that a very, well, that's a very Gnostic idea, isn't it? Uh, it's a dualistic idea. That's for certain. Yeah. Um, yeah and so, so I'm going to say it differently. I, um, Michael, Michael may uh, disagree with me on this too, but I, at one point there's a really important overlap in what, what I, I think what we would say. And that is uh, I would, I would distinguish between the miraculous and the supernatural. Um, and I'm going to use supernatural in a very narrow way that may actually still be dualistic. But the idea, uh, uh, we've had this idea of the miraculous, it's rather magical, as if God interferes with secondary causes. Uh, whereas we've talked in the past about how he, he in fact, he consents uh, to secondary causes of natural law and, and human volition. Um, and that's that's where evil comes from, and <laughs> that's where yeah, suffering yeah. and all of that. Um, so, but that but then people will see something that we would call a miracle, and, and then they're questioning maybe you know do you not believe in the supernatural when, when and it's like well, I I actually do, but I what I what I'm saying then is uh, the I'm, I'm talking about the the radical transcendence of God being radically imminent in love as the ground of all things in the universe. So, or as a what's as if Frank Schaefer says, you know, bef how how physicists say before before there was matter, there was energy, and that energy has a name, and it's love. So, so so when I my point of that is when I lay hands on someone, and if we if we see them uh, get healed in a way that that we, you, you would not normally um, uh, recognize as natural. Um, is it magic? No. Is it miracle? Uh, well, did God interfere? Maybe not. But is it supernatural? Yes, in this way. That, that is the love of God that is the ground of all things, that is the active ingredient in that healing, not something... And, and also maybe in a non-dualistic way, that this love permeates uh, the universe right down to the foundations. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still working it out, that, and that's not quite what Michael said. but uh, well, and, and I want to No, tell but people, I, I like it. I like it. It works for me. Go, go back I and like listen it. to the theology of consent, because that will really bring you mm -hmm. up to speed with what Brad's saying, um, if, if you're listening to this. Because that whole, I think, Brad, what you're saying about the, the whole idea of consent really makes a lot of sense because isn't that what you're doing guys when you're getting, when you're talking about deliverance, like you were talking about how, when, when you transition to the idea of inner healing instead of deliverance, that, um, it really became a huge, a huge part piece of that was the idea of repentance, which is basically 
just just changing your mind, changing the way you think about God and yourself. Right, and I was moving from I was moving from how coercion to to love as mm. the active ingredient, mm. and in fact, it changes you because I, I remember one of the things that helped me let this go was my my oldest son said to me, you know, Dad, he came to me weeping, and he said, when you do deliverance ministry, he'd seen me do it publicly. He said, you become mean. And I'm like, wow. And it's like, yeah, but I mean to the demons, right? And wow. and he's and he's just like, I don't, you know. So which begs the question. Okay, so what was Jesus doing with the whole exorcism thing? Uh, what, and, what's going on and, there? And that brings up that that brings up, um, you know, we've had tons and tons of questions on the Facebook page that are basically from that. Like for instance, Judy is talking about the strong man. Um, Jenny's talking about the personification of evil. And, and one thing that I want to, I want to jump at is what was Jesus doing? Because it seems like when you, when you look at like, I I can't remember if it was Luke or where it was at that I was finding that, but that there was this, um, twofold part of Jesus's ministry that was preaching the gospel and casting out demons, which seemed Mm -hmm. to entail the healing. Mm -hmm. So what, what was that? And then the, maybe a preemptive question, even to that and maybe we should put these in order. Maybe that's where we should go. But, but, um, sorry, I'm reading, I'm reading through. (laughs) We've got so many questions here. Janetta says, what about the temptation story with Jesus? Let's start there. Let's take this in order because this is the first place where we really have an encounter between Satan and, or, or the Satan and Jesus. So what do we do with the temptation narrative of Jesus? You want to go first, Brad? You want me to? No, I'll let you take that one, Michael. Okay. Here's what I, when I read the temptation narrative, what I see is Jesus dealing with his own dark side potential, not actuality, but potential. And what he's faced with are three challenges. The challenges to comfort, the challenge to his own personal safety, and the challenge to his own personal security. To change the stones into bread. Does he have the ability to do this? Absolutely. It's a gift given to him by God as the true human. It's a gift given to all humans, but it's given to him, and through him we also possess it. Can he turn the stones into bread? Yes. Does he trust his Father to feed him? Yes. Which will he do, feed himself or trust his Father? He trusts his Father. He could have gone to the dark side, could have turned the stones into some nice San Francisco sourdough, filled them up with a little clam chowder, and been happy as a camper. But he knew that who he was was about trusting his Abba. Second is the temptation, throw yourself off the sacrificial apparatus, the greatest religious apparatus in the world. Show the religious world that you have all the authority over it. And God will save you. God will be on your side. Jesus thinks to himself, It's true. Scripture says that. Scripture says if I jump off the temple, that God will be on my side. But that's an ego question. If I jump off the temple in order to prove that I'm the Son of God, and God's angels come and bear me up, and everybody oohs and ahs, have I really heard what my Father's wishes are for me in regard to this institution, Mm. which he will later uh, prophetically... um, uh, uh, shut down. The third is the temptation for Jesus to become the national security director of the human empire, to become the Darth Vader, Mm. you know, and that's potential. The guy has enormous power. Mm. I mean, all humans have this power. It doesn't take a Jesus or a Hitler, you know, to exercise that kind of influence on a population. Mm. We all have this power. Jesus is, is tempted to, to only do one thing. Worship the process of accusation. Worship the process of, of us and them mentality, creating, creating scapegoats. And Jesus refuses to do that because that's what the cross is about. It's about him becoming the accused. And so what Jesus is doing in the temptation narrative is, is, is rejecting his own dark side potential. And I think the same happens with all of us in our life. So we are 
constantly all of us the potential to engage the dark side, which means to use the power that God's given us for good, for evil. Hmm. Hmm. Sorry, Michael, we lost it just the the last little bit, but I think it it made it, the context fit once once it wrapped up. Sorry for everybody listening. The our our video feed every now and then can be a little wacky, so bear with us. <laughs> you got to love technology. I think you need to hear the question behind the question there of the of the, of the Facebooker. And, and that is like you've got this this thing supposedly coming to Jesus and it talks to him and I mean it's treated it really is treated like that and 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 Michael's not denying that he's just framing it in what if we're going to be literalistic what was going on mm. that's the question mm-hmm. and, and uh, I think that was a that was a, a, a fair way to to put it so so let me ask you in, in that context. What about um, like when it says that Jesus was taken on the pinnacle of the temple? You know, was this all done internally? Do you think? Do you think that this is like in his mind he's playing out the different scenarios and here's the possibilities, or did it? it was that a literal occurrence? <laughs> I I I wouldn't put it as either. It's 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 both and more than both together. I mean, if if I think something in my head. And it's it's vivid. Is it real? I, you know, you know, the brain, the human brain, Ray, can't tell the difference between fantasy and reality. Mm. If you have sex with your wife, certain neural pathways fire. If you fantasize about sex with another woman, those exact same pathways fire. Mm. Your brain can't tell the difference mm. between real sex and fake sex. I mean, and if if you if you are in, in the desert on a vision quest like Jesus was on was a vi- you know and you've been fasting and you're not hydrated and you have a vision is it in your head mm. is it real mm. i mean does it matter mm. you know mm. i like that michael um uh, emphasizes it. it's more than it's more than it's not just less than we're not saying less than here um, one another example on the, on the, on this is to to do with um, you know are these real temptations then it's like absolutely they are whereas I think uh, sometimes mm-hmm. we uh, in treating it as well the devil came along and he said these things to Jesus but uh, Jesus wasn't really tempted he just kind of answered mm-hmm. him and he and he like just kind of overcame him you know and I feel like um, Romans, this this may push our theology too, but but this is classic patristic theology and Karl Barth that, that Romans eight that Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. flesh. That means that when he was he was in the womb, he is he is sharing DNA with his mother. He is her blood is pumping through his body through the placenta. And at the cellular level, if he didn't take on the likeness of sinful flesh, then, then really um, he's just coming to earth as, as a sort of a, an innocent Adam. But it's like it's much more than that. And so then in this temptation, it's like he really has to face these things and he really has to overcome. And it's a real victory, not just a nice narrative, you know, where where. And so I, um, uh, in in bearing in bearing the sins of the world. It's like it's bearing the sins of humanity in his body, you know, and, and then what does that mean? And what does that look like? Um, for those who would rush to calling that heresy, I think you'd want to double check your own theology, you know, uh, yeah. on what the church has always stood on as a foundation. Does that make sense? Oh, oh yeah. And, and another piece here is, you remember the in the Middle Ages, there was that great debate, uh, the Latin phrase is posa non peccator, non posa non peccator. Jesus was either able not to sin, or Jesus was not able to sin. If you say Jesus was not able to sin, then the temptation narratives, it's a cakewalk, it's irrelevant. It's a joke. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if, 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 if there wasn't a risk involved in that temptation narrative, then then we should just forget about it. I mean, let's 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 put it even more bluntly. If there's no risk involved in that temptation narrative, I mean, if God doesn't put it all on the line, if Jesus had had screwed up at that point, say bye bye to the universe. Mm-hmm. You, you know, and where do we see this? We see this in the second temptation narrative in Gethsemane. 
in Gethsemane, which is a it's a rehash uh, of the. And this is what makes Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ so profound: is he brings that devil figure into the Gethsemane narrative. Mm -hmm. We don't tend to think of the devil in that narrative, but it is precisely there where Jesus has to renounce the principle of violence, mm. you know, the satanic principle of violence. And so, and, and then the third temptation is on the cross. That is the last temptation. If you are the Son of God, come down off there. Mm. I mean, if Jesus, you know, we say, oh, Jesus was divine. He could not be tempted. He just kind of... He was, you know, he just kind of resisted. The, if that's the case, he's no good to me. Yeah. Is no, my he, would have, he would have been good to Adam and Eve in the garden before they fall, but he could not yeah. have saved fallen fallen Adam and Eve. He mm. unless unless he entered into that. That's right. Into that ring. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. That, that's I why I, I just Michael's reject the. Say, sorry. <laughs> I still want to hear what you're going to want to say about how. Jesus deliverance ministry and what's going on with that. So, so, so let me throw, let me throw a question in with, with Jesus's deliverance ministry that you can kind of tie in here. Um, Luke was, was on the Facebook page was also asking about that. And one of the questions he asked that I thought was a really good question is what about Jesus refusing to let demons speak? You know, what was that all about? Or what about like, you know, the, the lady that was following Paul through the city, you know, and, and this kind of thing. Um, or, you know, what about uh, the fact that they were talking about, have you come to torment us before the time? And, you know, all of these different things that it seems like demons in those cases know that humans wouldn't normally know. Like they knew that he was the son of God, but he commanded them not to tell anybody. Okay. Uh, again, I, I want to say straight up front that, that the demonic manifests itself in culturally conditioned forms. So, is it any less a casting out of the demonic when an alcoholic steps into a 12-step meeting and makes the decision to quit drinking mm. than when uh, in the um, African uh, savanna a medicine man uh, casts out uh, 50 demons out of a little girl that speak ancient Arcadian, mm. you know? Mm. I mean, is it is that any different than a person sitting on a psychiatrist's couch that gets over um, bitterness and anger and resentment? Is that any different um, from uh, Dr. King, who, who challenged uh, the demonic institution of civil injustice? I mean, they're all cultural manifestations. So what I want to say is, in the gospel, what we find are manifestations of the demonic that are part and parcel of that Hanakic worldview. Mm. That's what's being, that's what's being, that's how it's manifesting. So rather than going to the Gospels and saying, oh, this is how demons always manifest, mm. we just need to go, that's how they manifested in a first century Palestinian context. Mm. And, and he accommodated to that. He, he absolutely accommodated to that. He, absolutely. He's like, no, no, we should really have a couch here. Just sit yeah. down. <laughs> no. <laughs> He steps into it fully, right? <laughs> right, and and that's what we're called to do as well. I think. I mean, um, uh, some of us, uh, I think, are are fairly comfortable doing counseling, where we are dealing with demonic structures. Mm. Some of us are more comfortable in a more traditional deliverance ministry because that's the worldview of the people we're dealing with. Mm. Some of us, some of us are are are. Um, more comfortable um, engaging um, uh, societal structures, you know, in peace marches or, or protest movements or whatever, where we're confronting strong power. But it manifests itself differently. So in the Gospels, there's just that accommodation. So I, I, I would never go to the Gospels and say, oh, demons always go into pigs, mm. or demons always know, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the presence of Christ. What I will tell you is this, though. There's one thing that, that I've, is my experience. If you go to deal with the demonic and you haven't dealt with it first in yourself, it's the, the the darkness on the other side of the, that's dealing with that knows this, and they will it will come back at you, hmm. it will bite you in the in, well, in, in big time. Let let me ask you in in light of what you're Satan saying, Satan cannot cast out Satan. In other words, so in, in light of what you're saying there, like for instance, you brought up the pigs. If if the Satan is an anthropological phenomenon, how hmm. do you explain something like that? Like like demons jumping off 
and you know off of the person into the pigs yeah i don't i don't I, for me that's it's not a um a literal narrative it's a narrative about a scapegoat uh, I, I mean, Rene Girard's analysis of this text in his book, The Scapegoat, for me, is one of the finest there ever was. Uh, one, we're dealing here with a Roman military metaphor. Um, the demon has a name, uh, Legion, you know. Second, we're dealing with a scapegoat of a community. That that scapegoat is someone who, who is into self-abuse. They cut themselves. You know, that's part of their theatrical act that, that keeps them in connection to the community, but the community also needs that, mm. you know. So, so if in the narrative what you really have is this, this, this figure who has been mimetically entangled with all the members of the community, a legion of them, as it were, and they are cast out, and I put that in quotes, they are cast out from him, and... There happens to be a herd of swine there, which, of course, represents tr un uncleanness in, in, to an nth degree for, for a, a good Jew. It, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's more than symbolic because there's a real healing that takes place. Mm. But the pigs function narratively as this symbol of the um, a powerful character of what it means to take a scapegoat and mimetically disentangle them from the community so that they can be in their right mind again. Mm. But yeah. the same thing can occur in a psychiatrist's office. Yeah. Michael also alluded earlier that these things can, uh, they, whatever it is, that it, it can, it can de-link from you and take on a life of its own, whatever that means, right? So mm -hmm. I think what, what a lot of the uh, folks listening would want to, they may be struggling with this, is if they're not personal, then why are they treated as personal? Well, because they're generated anthropologically. Uh, <laughs> but also, mm -hmm. um, you know, Brian Zahn puts it this way, that the demons and Satan are, are less than personal, but they're more than, they're more than projections and right. principles. They are a real phenomena of evil, yeah. mm. and yeah. so again, we're saying it's even worse than you think. Wow. If if that if you're worried about us downplaying well, it, but on the other hand, these are things to be redeemed in the personal sense, as if they were fallen angels. And then, and let's 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 know this: in the Gospels, no demon has a name. Satan is not a name; it's a function. It's a He's title. Accuser. It's kind of like a title, isn't it? Legion. Yeah. Legion is not a name. Mm -hmm. It's it's a it's it's the designation of of a, of a military unit. Mm. So in the Gospels, you don't have wow. all these demons with names like you do in First Enoch, where they've all got names: Uriel and Bazile and Bazalile and wow. you know Curly, Curly Larry and Mo and everybody else. Mm. You don't have that in the Gospels. Mm. Mm. My own sense too is that when we're dealing with this stuff, uh, we could stand to be far more Christ-centered. That the the conversation is not with the demons anyway. We want to have a conversation with Christ and yeah. and, and come into alignment with him. Rather, you know, when in doubt, uh, we, we, we repent, which is we turn towards Jesus. We turn towards Jesus from all these other things, and uh, we or we deal with them in His presence, and that that was one of the problems with the whole the whole exorcism thing. It was it was all about there was so much about um, uh, ego versus demon, and I wasn't sure they were different anyway. You know, and well, it's that's like, right. That's it. Come, we need to be. We need. To, so the call to inner healing was really actually the person saying you you need to stop having battles with demons and start taking people to the foot of the cross to receive the kindness of Jesus for their deepest needs and their deepest wounds. And when I started doing that, everything changed. Yeah. Well, you know, Karl Barth made the, made the great observation that whenever the devil is mentioned in the Bible, the devil's mentioned only to be dismissed. In Genesis 3, mentioned, dismissed. Book of Job, mentioned, dismissed. Zechariah, mentioned, dismissed. Gospel narrative, mentioned, dismissed. Revelation, mentioned, dismissed. I mean, you're exactly right, Brad. And 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 the 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 devil, the Satan, evil is never our focus. It it is a it's a distraction in many ways. When we are the presence of Christ, when we are speaking Jesus, when we are following Jesus, 
the darkness may may react in which case we we bring light into the darkness and continue to move on but somebody like Bob Larson who's got this school of exorcism you know where he hands out <laughs> these fake silver crosses you know, it's just, it's absurd nonsense. I mean, yeah. I, this guy's living like in the 11th century, and he thinks, he thinks that whatever is given to him by these demons is pure truth. I mean, it just, it, it, there's a satanic guy right there. There's a guy that's more full of evil than the people he's trying to cast. Wow. Out wow. Uh, so so let, let me throw something in here, and because I know the obvious, this is the obvious question that would kind of get raised is, well, first of all, let me preface it with this. In the last episode with Trip York, we were talking about his book, The Devil Wears Nada. And Trip was kind of talking about um, the the last 2,000 years, the Christian belief of um, kind of the orthodox position on Satan was that he was a non-person, that, or that Satan, I'll say he, I'm using the pronoun, but that Satan was a non-person, that Satan was not... Satan was not a creation of God, but he was the lack of the goodness of God. So God's entire, he couldn't have been a creation of God because God's entire creation, he called it good over and over and over in the book of Genesis. So that the satanic principle is actually just a lack of the good. So my question is that that was kind of what he was, he was kind of getting very similar to what you guys are saying as far as the idea of the satanic as non-being. Um, a lot of people are going to ask the question, if the Satan is an anthropological reality, um, why why did God create us with that possibility? Why why do we have the possibility to go that way? Which, in some ways, almost is kind of circular because we, if we believe in a literal Satan, we still believe that God created the principle of evil. But because I know people are going to ask that question, how would you guys respond to that? Dead silence. Let me let me throw. <laughs> I'm gonna throw some more crickets in there. <laughs> well, again, you know, Karl Barth called evil the impossible possibility. Hmm. Um, and that's what in or you know what you just talked about with Tripp, um, the theory from Augustine to to Karl Barth and all through Roman Catholic theology is evil is non-being. It's the Absence of goodness. The Latin term is privatio boni. Um, that was what he was the saying. Yeah. Of goodness. Yeah. That was. You know, uh, it's it's lacking. You know, it's it it doesn't have something in and of itself. Um, there's there's truth in that, um, but that does not mean um, that it doesn't pos possess uh, an energy, a power. It still manifests, and we, it still I manifests, mean, just look at yeah. the world, right? Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and so uh, one of the things I would want to, like, like, let's remind people at this point, um, uh, there are those who may say, oh, so Brad and Michael don't believe in the devil now. It's like, yes, we do, <laughs> and it's worse than you <laughs> Maybe think. Maybe more than you do. <laughs> more. That's right, that's right. It is, that's right, it is worse than you think. Yeah. And, and, and this is where the redemption of Jesus becomes so extraordinary. Oh, man, you just... Go read Brad's essay in uh, Stricken by God, mm -hmm. and you get this feeling as though we've so limited Jesus' atoning work to this simple transaction thing, and it is so much more than that. It is so much more encompassing. It's so universal. Yes, Brad, we believe in evil, and it's worse than people think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so, so if it's not that, then what is it? What what is, what is this? I, I, I'm just thinking about in, in the, if we could give people a sense of the big picture Satan, back to the Satan, or what is that where we're at, Rayborn, or do we need to look at some other stuff? Uh, no, that, that that's absolutely a great question. Where what is what is evil? Where did it come from? Why is it here? Why do we have the potential for darkness? Like I know, I know you're 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 quoting Karl Barth, but these are some of the questions. What is evil? What is the evil principle? Evil is live spelled backwards. <laughs> wow, that is actually pretty profound. I, Michael, I'm sorry, but you got to get one of these on that. 
<laughs> that is actually profound. I don't know. No, that really is profound when you stop and think about it. So if it, because what you're talking about with the what was that Latin term again? Uh, Provatio boni. Yeah, yeah. When you're saying that, if evil is simply a lack of the good, death is not a death is not its own substance. It's a lack of life. No. So it's it's also a lack of love, you know. Yes. Um, there, Archbishop Lazar, he he also talks like this. He says that there that, that evil has no ontological reality, mm. but it exists and manifests where there's a lack of empathy, and so, so yes, it's yes, anti-life yes. and it's anti-love. Wow! Wow! Yep. That hey, is I so want to cheer too, man. Oh wait, wait, wait! <laughs> Sorry, I gotta give you one of these. You don't get a lot on that one. <laughs> you got a lot on that one, Brad. Uh, that's that is profound. Ooh. So it really does. I mean, we're, we're here's the thing, and this this is on our podcast over the last two years as we've talked about things like ultimate redemption, nonviolent atonement, um, you know, altering views of hell and all these alternative views of hell and all this kind of thing. What we keep coming to is that love is is really it's like first john 4 says god is love so if we use scripture if we use demonic possession if we use whatever we want to to somehow give us an out to love people then we are participating in the satanic even with the religious garb of inerrancy or casting out demons like you were talking about with bob larson I mean, you look at some of the stuff that I've watched some of his clips and, you know, you see people treated as less than the image of God. Yeah. And when you see that, that's, it's hard to call that anything but evil. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. It can help some people, but it, as often as not, there's a spiritual abuse element to that. Um, And it it may just... I see um, amazing, amazing parallels to to really uh, uh, high quality um, hypnotists to what mm-hmm. I was doing, both in in uh, deliverance ministry and also in 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 renewal prayer. And I don't want to say that my friends who've you know, the, let's say you they 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 pray and they get filled with the Spirit and they you know maybe they go down on the floor and all of that. Um, I don't want to say that none, none of that is a genuine encounter with God. I'm, I'm just saying uh, I, that I must confess that some of my practices in this and the fruit I saw from it were remarkably like performance hypnotists. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, yeah. And I, I all, uh, so I think I said this online, but I'll, I'll reiterate it, that I, I'm not saying that uh, just because I can make you have a demon speak through you doesn't, I mean, you know, it doesn't mean you have a demon. It, it could just mean I, I'm good at power of suggestion. But but so, too, um, uh, just because I can make you smell burnt toast doesn't mean there's no such thing as burnt toast. Mm, mm. So so there, there, there are authentic, there's a, authentic reality to our experiences of God and the demonic. But I'm just I'm just mm. saying there's also this whole other thing going on. Well, Brad, let's, and, and we, okay. Go ahead, and we need to take this one more step, Ray. Yeah. We've been talking about the demonic in terms of persons. We also need to talk about the demonic in terms of structures, mm. structures of oppression, mm. institutions of oppression, the Department of Defense, the mm. Pentagon, mm. the Kremlin, the White House, um, the KKK, um, uh, focus on the family. I mean, these are Whoa. demonic institutions. No, no, wait a minute. Wait yeah, a minute. yeah, you're going to have to unpack wait that one for a lot of people, I know. But but, but listen, they all have the same function. Mm, the accuser. To, the accuser, to create an us-them mentality, to create an enemy-other. Any structure whose goal is to create an enemy-other, some I am not this, I am not, has is satanic. Yeah. Oh, you Michael, know? I'm with you. When I when I say that, I, I'm laughing because there's a lot of people I'm finding that tune in. Uh, you, this the thing about our podcast is we've got a four year ongoing discussion here, and sometimes people jump in a week ago and and think they're hearing the entirety of it. So 
what you're saying is absolutely, I think, right on. But there's a lot Look, of people t- that are going to go, whoa, when you talk about focus. Today on the news, yeah. today on the news, CNN uh, has North Korea threatening to, to launch um, uh, uh, rockets to see if they can send a nuke to hit the U.S. because we're their enemy, right? Mm. Now, is that any different than the rhetoric? I'm going to go listen to preachers on Christian TV that are loving nuclear bombs and their Mike and their morality. Is that any different? Amen. Amen. No, it's the same thing. Well, and actually, Michael, I think I, I'd like to take it a step farther and say that it's actually way worse because you're doing it in the name of God. I mean, what, when we talk yeah. about the Ten Commandments, you know, uh, one of the big ones was you shall not take the Lord, the name of the Lord your God in vain. And anytime we're using God's authority to authorize something that's accusatory, then we're taking the Lord's name in vain. Whereas when these secular institutions do it, or however you want to say it, and when the Department of Defense does it, they don't do it in the name of Jesus. When someone like Focus on the Family or one of these televangelists gets up and starts uh, coming against gays and coming against, you know, uh, saying that we should... Muslims or, or whatever. Or saying that we should assassinate Hugo Chavez or whatever. Right. When they're doing it, they're doing it with the backing in their mind of Jesus, which to me makes it a much greater sin, if I can say it that way. Yeah. Well, and I, as I said at the beginning of the program, when you unravel any of these threads... You're, you're, you're unraveling all the threads of a dominant Christian theological tradition. Mm. Um, you know, and, and, you know, Brad, I'm sitting here thinking, wouldn't it be fun if you and I could rent a retreat center for a week and bring about 40 people together and just do nothing but sit and unravel the rug and maybe by Thursday start reweaving it? Mm. Mm. Yeah, because I, I don't think I don't think deconstruction is the end of the story, is it? I mean, you, no, no. You really, uh, what we're doing is we're we're saying there there there's been a a, a history of interpretation that mm. has replaced the the living presence of Jesus among yes. us, and we know we we we've had that experience like when the three of us were at, um, in North Carolina and we we went right. we had that group talk about. Uh, uh, Ananias and Sapphira, and we felt we felt uh, Jesus was there unraveling the thing, and then he began to put something back together, and it was yeah. profound. And uh, and uh, uh, you know, I, to use other other traditions, like it was anointed, right, <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> but, it, but the real, and, and so, so this is not just about destroying the old; it's about saying there was a. This is again quoting Zond. It's like we we that train. That train took us as far as it would go, and if we just sit on that train, we're going to asphyxiate ourselves, and people are getting off that old train, and now they're they're wandering around in the train station looking for the right, right train, and how will they know which train to get on? Some of them will never get on another train because they're so burnt. Mm. Uh, what what what? I think what we're saying is you'll recognize the right train because it will look a lot like Jesus, and that has to do with self-giving love and radical forgiveness. Mm. Um, and, and, and then I, we can get rolling again. Metaphor. What's that? I want to take your metaphor for a second. I want to take your metaphor and historicize it. Yeah. I, if you, if the train, in fact, has come to the end of the station, if Christendom as we know it um, uh, has been deconstructed, and I think it has, mm. um, and and Christians have gotten off that train, the ones that have gotten off that train, they're, 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 of course, there are still others sitting on that train waiting for it to go. Hmm. But Singing there are a lot. religion, yep. That's yeah. it. But a lot have gotten off, and they're wandering around that train station, and they notice it's the end of the line. So what a lot of them do is they say, oh, well, we don't need this Christian thing anymore. We're just going to do whatever we're going to do at the train station. When all they need to do is walk a mile in the dirt, in the dust, in the brush, in the scrub, in the trees, and over the mountaintop, and there's another train and another train line. Mm. Yep. Can, can I just you say know? at this point, guys, I think that um, a huge piece of this for, for Steve and I on this podcast and talking about this new train is exactly what we're doing here. It's this idea that I was just thinking about it today. It's like theology in the round. You know what I mean? Everybody knows theater in the round is this place where the entire audience gets to kind of 
um, gets to kind of partake of it. But we, we're still living under this paradigm in this transitionary period from whatever it was that we inherited to, to what we're moving into now, where it seems like it ha- this deconstruction process that we're talking about has to be a participatory thing for people. It can't be a it can't just be a lecture format. It can't just be a, like you were talking about, it just hit me a minute ago, Brad, when you were talking about love, that the idea of love is that, that kenosis, that self emptying where, you know, the ego is demonic. It's this, that we have to empty ourselves of that to where we allow people in to do exactly what we're doing right now, where we can, where we can sit and we can do this in the round and recognize everyone as being on equal footing. Um, I, I tell you guys, when we do this kind of thing, like when we were, when we were at the wild goose festival and we had that Ananias and Sapphira moment, I think the huge part of that, the huge central element of that was this idea that we were all sitting there as brothers and sisters sharing the spirit, you know, and there wasn't, there wasn't the, there was no power brokers that were measuring out the spirit for us, but we were all participating in that. Um, and I don't know what that means for the future of the movement of Jesus. Um, but it sure seems like we've got to get away from this institutional mindset that would, um, dispense God for us. One thing it's meant for me is, um, short of my, my kind of my memoirs, which I'm writing now, they're not really memoirs, but they're kind of a thing short of that. I'm not going to ever write a book again that has my own name on it. It's, it'll be well, it'll done in community. So Brad and I are talking right now with a, a, about a book project together, you know, and uh, I've got another a fellow in Australia, a, a scholar, I'm talking about a, a Girard book together. I just don't, I just think that we were meant to be in relationship, we were meant to be in community, and there's nothing better when scholars get together and do their work together. Um, they, they create something that is far more powerful than just, well, gee, this is Michael Harden's theology, or this is Brad Jerzak's theology, or this is N.T. Wright's theology, or this is Carl Barth's theology. You know, you're, and, and it's a model. It's a model of cooperation. It's a model of engagement and risk. Yeah. You know, can can I, mean, I when, can I take that even a step further? And I'd say I'd say that scholars are an important piece of that, and yet it goes even beyond that, to where the body of Christ, because you know, scholars are in the minority. I mean, you know what I mean? The body of Christ is, is really big and the scholarly wing of it is, is a piece of that, but it's not the whole thing. And so like when we were at wild goose, a huge thing for me was that we pointed out was that Kevin Miller, who's a a film guy, you know, Mm -hmm. he doesn't have the theological training all of a sudden gets, gets the piece of that whole conversation that changed everything. Well, I wouldn't sell Kevin short there. Kevin is, is a good theologian in his own right, and he yeah. does have some theological training. You know, I mean, I, I, I'll be honest with you. If I go to a, a Bible study with a bunch of lay people, you know, um, and all they're interested in doing is pooling their ignorance and their opinions, yeah. well, I think this, well, I think this, well, I think that, I'm out of there. Yeah, yeah, sure. Because I'm not interested in sharing stupidity. Sure. If the same people have spent any amount of time at least working the English text, thinking it through, working it through, puzzling it through, then I'm willing to engage them. But I I am tired of what I call evangelical Bible study. Uh, Absolutely, Michael. You know, like Sunday school, you sit in a Sunday school class. I I just can no longer do it. Yeah. And and people just pool their ignorance. And it's just like, I I don't give a, 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 a flying cahoot about what you think. Ask me my opinion on your cancer and what you ought to do with it. Ask me my opinion on, you know, the, what your child rearing. You're not going to do that. Yeah. You're not yeah. going to do that. You want a professional opinion, you go to a professional. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I don't want to sell scholars too short in the body of Christ. Well, no, and I don't either, Michael, and I want to be careful. I, that's not at all my intention. But, I know, I know. Because I know. I'm complete. obviously it wouldn't be or I wouldn't have you guys on, but um, I, I – I completely hear what you're saying, and I think the difference in in what you're talking about and what I'm talking about is the the typical evangelical Bible study consists of people who have never thought more than 15 minutes about the topic they're talking about. 
that yeah. have never given any time to researching it, that have never really well, spent time, you know, uh, meditating yeah. on it and, and reading what they can. But there's a lot of us out there that, you know, I by no means am any, am any kind of scholar or, you know, I, I, I tell people I went to Bible college, but it wasn't for theological training. It was for indoctrination. And yet, <laughs> and yet, um, you know, I'm a guy that I'm spending loads of time reading people like you guys and a lot of other guys to get myself up to speed. Um, so I think that I, I just don't want people here because the majority of the people that are listening to what we're saying right now aren't scholars and yet they have a tremendous importance in the body of Christ and they're listening to two hour conversations about the Satan because yeah, they're but you interested. See, the, very, the very fact that they come on the beyond the box Facebook page and put the questions, the very fact that they're even going to listen to a two hour podcast on this, exactly. that sets them apart from the it, kinds of folks I'm just talking exactly, about. Exactly. Michael, that's what I'm saying. Exactly. We're on the same yeah. page, brother. Well, we can get there. There's also the element of developing that contemplative posture where we're open to receive uh, what the spirit has for us when we're together. And so that's why I get these riches out of my sons. Right. And um, at the same time, um, uh, um, you know, even in a sense, coming back to this idea of evil, when when Hannah Arendt went to uh, went to Israel, I think it was where they where they had the Eichmann trials. Adolf Eichmann, the, the Nazi, and um, right. she was expecting to see a monster, and, right. and and she was expecting to be overwhelmed by the presence of evil. And when when she wrote um, she, a, a series of, of articles for the newspaper about those trials, she said what shocked her was the banality of evil. That's what right. she meant was mm. he was not this powerful, ominous, evil presence at all. He was a walking cliché. One cliche after that, there was a complete uh, loss of personality, an emptiness there, a, almost like um, um, it was just one one slogan after another. My concern, <laughs> as it relates to what we were just talking about, is that, uh, is when we go into a evangelical default mode that we have all these all these uh, pre-prepared slogan answers for every question and and most most then we're dealing with the banality of evil again and, mm. and, and mindlessness for example on the whole our mythology of Satan it's like everybody knows that demons are fallen angels how did we know that we didn't get it from the Bible oh I get it we inherited it from the last guy who shared the slogan and it's time to look at these things afresh and so when we do deconstruction it's not just about tearing a good thing down it's about saying we've got this bowl of soup here and it's got awfully crusty on top i wonder if there's anything under there mm-hmm. and, and, and and i think that 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 uh there's scholars willing to do that and there's fresh minds willing to ask the, the questions that actually guide me mm-hmm. so uh, uh and then and then what what i hear michael uh, resisting is is sort of the the, the banality of evangelical e- e- evil through uh, I, I, a doctrine, I, you know. And I and I'm re- resisting the banality of of just bad theology. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like you said, that's just sloganeering. Because yeah. you know what, there are people that are going to listen to this broadcast, and they're going to walk away, and they're still going to put on the comment page, "Oh, they really don't believe in the yeah, devil." Yeah. Mm-hmm. That they're going to do that, yeah. you know. And, and it's like. <sighs> Adventures and missing the point. Adventures and missing the point. Yeah, yeah. Wow, guys. Uh, let me just let me just throw out one more question for you because um, I, I just thought this was a really good one, and I was I was going to throw it out earlier, but I love these conversations because we move so fast. Sometimes the the to use the train metaphor again, the train's fifty miles ahead of me, and I'm going, oh crap! I wish I'd have thrown that in there. <laughs> um, I, w- I just want to read this is this is a paragraph that Deborah on the Facebook page wrote that I just thought wow that's this is this is a really good question. She said I've heard some arguments that explain my experiences away, giving credit to the brain's awesomeness and its dance with my religious upbringing, training, childhood, etc. But for me, that's just too easy and only half true. To be fair, my experiences with Christ's energy would have to be handled with the same logic, and I would have to conclude that my God is simply an idea about something maybe even an idea essential to my well-being, but not an actual person. So when someone hears the things that we're saying and about how 
the satanic is an anthropological phenomenon. And yet we have these spiritual experiences that feel very similar with God. How do we not then let the categories collapse to where we start applying the same rules to God and we go, well, maybe God is just an anthropological experience as well. And maybe I'm, I'm it. How, how do we keep from going there? Yeah. Well, let me say a couple things first. Um, so, so one is um, the Bible does acknowledge some God experiences as anthropological. It calls them idols. Wow. That's a very wow. real thing. Mm. And even we as Christians can have uh, Christian idols. Um, so, so let's get off that off the table for a moment. <laughs> Just because there's idols, though, doesn't mean there's not a reality to this God. Hmm. But I'd also want to be cautious about saying, well, if if the devil's not real, then God's not real. It's like, wait a minute, that's dualism again. That's the Manachian heresy. Yeah. That, uh, these are not of the same order whatsoever. And that spiritual experiences uh, uh, as manifestations of the demonic, which are non-personal, uh, that's not a proof text to say that 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 our experience of of God is non-personal. They're they're not of the same order. That's comparing uh, apples with 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 uh, tin foil, <laughs> you know. So that's a couple things from the hip. Yeah, I I I think those are those are excellent. I want to pick up on the the first one, Brad. There's um. There's a funny thing that we do when we when you anthropologize the devil, when you say, okay, we, we made the devil, not God. Some people get the immediate impression that evil has somehow been uh, demoted, hmm. taken from general to, you know, to um, sergeant kind of thing. And that evil then is not really evil, and that it's not heinous, and that it's not seductive, and that it's not uh, powerful. Because God didn't make it, you know, so so it's it's just us, um, and that's just not the case. That is just not the case. Um, one of the things, one of the one of the failures, I think, of Christian anthropology, um, and this comes from uh, Calvin in the West. It comes from Augustine. Um, God is great, and I, as a human, am nothing. I am just a worm. I'm a nothing. And, and the fact is, is that. Um, Scripture really doesn't talk that way about humans. What is the what is the human that you're mindful of him? The 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 human that you should care for him, Psalm eight. You know? God became flesh. God became human. You know, God didn't become a, 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 a spider, God didn't become a raindrop. God became flesh. He became like you and me and everybody else. There we need to to begin to recognize that the human um is very, very special and very, very, very powerful made in the image of God. We are co-creators. Mm. I mean, we've, cre we've created this thing called civilization. Mm. I, it's, I mean, just stop and think about it. The ants didn't do it. The primates didn't do it. The fish didn't do it, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Spiders didn't do it. Look at what we've managed to do. I and mean, we've done this incredible thing. It sucks, but we did it, <laughs> right? So, so... That's the first thing. Second thing is that um, I think with Brad, and I, I just want to keep kind of affirming these things, to compare God and the devil, um, we're, we're dealing with different orders of things. God, you know, the, the devil is not simply a not God. The, the devil, evil is the privation of good. The problem with, the problem with that logic is that um, it, it almost has to, you almost have to be dualistic. To, to get it. Evil evil um, is powerful. Evil's horrible. Evil is is um, is like I said, it's decoupled from us. It's a spirit there's a spirit out there, you know, and, and it manifests in a million different ways. A real you know? experience, real manifestations. Real man we're, just not, we're just saying they don't happen to be fallen angels. Can, can you, right. They are something else. Can you unpack then, that just a little bit when you say it's decoupled from us and, and that it's like, it, it almost makes it sound like it has its own entity? Can you? No, no, no. Listen, what, what we're doing, and this brings me to the third point. When we talk about the, the person, personality, and, and, and people say, 
oh, Michael and Brad, they, they don't believe the devil's a person. No, but I don't believe that you're a person either. Mm, I believe gotcha. yeah. I believe that we wow. together create personality. Mm. You are who you are because of your relationships. Yeah. I mean, the one thing we know that's a fact, you take a baby deer and, and a baby deer is born and its mother dies, the baby deer can still survive. You know, if it, if it makes smart choices and ev evades predators and, you know, take a human child put it in a crib and ignore it mm. and it will die wow we are we need each other we are our relationships and this brings me to god we talk about we talk about god and when we we talk about god and then we talk about jesus now why do we use the word god not for jesus but for something else as though jesus is not god why don't we use God for the Holy Spirit as though the Spirit is not God? Because we've got a bad doctrine of the Trinity. Mm. The fact is the doctrine of the Trinity, um, when, when the West introduced the, the term persona or person, three persons, one being, three persons, it's as though there are three personalities. And the whole Western notion of autonomous individuals, mm. you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, has screwed things up. The fact is the East used the term energies or modes or manifestations. One God, three energies, three modes of being, three ways of being. One God. And so you talk about the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Not God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Mm. So first of all, it's, our language has already been corrupted. Mm. Second of all, our understanding of what constitutes persons has screwed everything up. And so when people go, oh, they don't believe the devil's a person. No, I don't. But I don't believe God is a person either. Mm -hmm. God, God is Trinity. God is community. Mm -hmm. Community is personhood. Wow. Already, I mean, you know, this is John Zizioulis. This is Catherine Lacuna. This is Jurgen Moltmann. This is Karl Barth. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's good theological thinking has reframed that whole concept of person. And it, if we're not willing to do that. Well, then our, our theology, like Brad says, is stuck at the train station. Wow. I don't know if that's helpful or not. Yeah, absolutely it is. Absolutely it is. Brad's sitting there. Hmm. <laughs> you thinking, Brad? Yeah, no, mainly just affirming. Because <laughs> mm. I, I, I'm aware that, I'm aware that what, what happened is we, we took that word for person, and then in English we assume it's personality, and that mm -hmm. actually creates tritheism. Mm -hmm. The very thing the Muslims are rejecting, mm -hmm. you know, they're right that we have one God and that Jesus is his Messiah. I mean, they're wrong about some stuff, but when they're reacting to us, you need to understand they're reacting to a heresy. And, and, yeah. you know, yep. uh, and, and so we need to kind of revisit what we actually even believed in the first place because we've, we've drifted through sloppiness hmm. on some of these things. Uh, also, when, when we, when you mention person, um, you know, that I'm not a person, you're not a person, like the, there's a we thing to this. It got me thinking about um, about identity, that, that we have this myth or delusion of, of autonomous identity because it feels like we do. I feel like I'm an I and, and so on. And, and there's some maybe some truth to that experience. But w w what Romans talks about is we're in Adam or we're in Christ. Right. You know? And that's that's a collective... Um, and that we're in a body, and that we're, you know, so it, it's a fairly, it's a fairly modern idea, more, more from Nietzsche than from anywhere from the Bible. That I, I'm, a, I'm the, my own thing. You, um, you know, yeah. my my experience, and I'm sure you guys will resonate with this too. But my experience is, as you're as you're talking about this, about the kind of the fallacy of the idea of person as this autonomous thing. It makes so much sense because I think of myself just, just in my relationship with the two of you, you know, there are so many times when I'm reading something or I'm having a conversation and I find myself quoting you, Brad, or saying something that I heard you say, Michael. And in those moments, I'm proving that I'm not autonomous. In those yeah. moments, I'm saying, I'm saying I'm this inner individual and here's a contribution from my friend, Michael. Here's a contribution from my friend, Brad. And I find that... Here I am, you know, a year and a half after after meeting you guys, 
and realizing that I'm different because of my relationship with you guys, which tells me that I, that just the way you said that it explodes that whole category of the autonomous individual, because if I'm autonomous, I can't have any other influences, right? Again, once you start to unravel this thing called Christian theology, God, anthropology, atonement, ecclesiology, eschatology, the whole thing comes apart. Yeah. And and that's why, you know, it's so important to to actually let it come apart because it's not junk. Yeah. There's a lot of great threads in there. Yeah. And they can be rewoven so that really good news is announced, mm. so that God is really proclaimed. And the power of God is manifest to save and redeem and transform and nurture and care and all these things. Yeah. I mean, we we are so lucky to live in the times that we do. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we live in the most exciting time ever, I think, in, in human Christian theological history. We live in a very exciting time. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Guys, oh my goodness. This has been amazing. I have thoroughly enjoyed our our uh, theology in the round. Wow. Amazing stuff. <laughs> Michael, Brad, thank you so much. Everyone. I want to, I, I just want to leave one thought in your mind. If you, uh, some people have been asking what, what is a good book on this subject? Well, you're in luck because Michael has just uh, co-authored a book with a bunch of other people that kind of bat this topic around. Tell us a little bit about that. I, book, I'm Michael. just, I'm just a contributor. Yeah. What happened was uh, 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 James Bilby and, um, oh, I forget the author's uh, name, Eddie, uh, is his last name. Uh, they've done a series of books, Four Views on the Atonement, Four Views on this, Four Views on the Historical. They've, they've done a whole series of books that are really good at laying out um, different views on different topics. This one is not called Four Views because there are actually uh, seven contributors. Um, th- but there are four views that are presented. Um, it's called Understanding Spiritual Warfare. It was published last fall by uh, Baker Academic Press. And in that book, Walter Wink uh, was to make a contribution. And Walter, um, uh, because, of, because of his illness at the end of his life, couldn't do it. So Gareth Higgins uh, managed to take a number of Walter's essays, and he, and he kind of put them together to create an essay. And then each of the four people responds to the other three writer's essay. So I wrote um, uh, Walt, what would have been Walter's responses. I mean, I talked, you know, about what I wanted to write with Walter, you know, b- before he passed, and, and he liked the trajectory of what I was doing. But my, when it says, you know, by Walter Wink and Michael Harden in the book, um, it's actually, it's actually me writing them uh, kind of, you know, uh, with Walter there in my heart and my mind and my soul and, mm. and really trying to represent fairly uh, where I think Walter would have come from. And, and Walter Wink's works on, on the powers. Um, if you guys are looking for something else to read as far as structural evil there, it, it doesn't get better than Walter Wink on the powers. No, it doesn't. Um, that The book, the powers that be is a great introduction to, yes. uh, to Dr. Wink's work on the powers. So highly suggest that. Brad Jerzak, yeah. you, you're amazing. Michael Harden, you're amazing. Love you guys. Thanks for being on the podcast. You Love bet. you too. So, Ray, uh, have we established which one of you three is the devil? <laughs> well, we, it, that, w- that would make a really unholy trinity, I think. But, uh, <laughs> but I tell you, I tell you um, hopefully there was no accusatory role in the three of us, but just <laughs> hopefully uh, bringing some things to light. I tell you, Steve, yeah. this really got me excited, this idea of having um, a roundtable discussion. Mm-hmm. And this, this thought just popped in my head of just theology in the round. Yeah. Theology in the round. This idea that just like theater in the round where mm-hmm. you know you're you're doing a play completely in a circle where the entire audience you know all the way around you can participate in what's going on. Mm-hmm. That theology in the round, this idea that we can get some people together, we can bat yeah. some ideas around. So you and I have been talking and uh, we just are hoping that this will be the first among uh, more to come of these yeah. conversations. Um, Absolutely. and I tell you, Brad, thank you. You are amazing. Michael, thank <laughs> you. You are amazing. Your, your, uh, 
your minds blow me away, but even more so your hearts for people and your heart for Jesus blows me away. And uh, I'm just uh, honored that we were able to to do this. And, and the cool thing, Steve, is that we were able, I think this is probably the first episode that we've done with someone other than you and I that was in response that quickly. I mean, yeah. We we we've thrown this podcast fast. together in like two days after yep. this uh, comment stream came up. <laughs> it just so happened that Brad was going. Uh, he, he was in a hotel room in Edmonton, had nothing to do one afternoon <laughs> as he was waiting after the flight. And Michael happened to happened to be free that day, and so we were able to the three. And I, I happened to be off work, so it was kind yeah. of the perfect storm. It was, and um, we were able to set this thing up. So thank you guys and listeners. I can't wait to see mm-hmm. the comment stream from this one. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's, I'm sure it's going to evoke a lot of responses. It, it is such a, uh, it, I'll tell you, Ray, it's a topic that I didn't think I would be as fascinated with as I am. And I don't mean in a morbid sense of, you know, being fascinated by evil or anything like that. I just mean it, it's, you know, like I said in the, the opening segment, it's not something I had really taken the time to question for mm-hmm. years. Mm-hmm. And yet once I began to question it, it it really became fascinating to me because I thought, how far can this go? How how much of even our view of Satan is a result of our own deception? You know, well, you, how much of it is is a twisting in our own minds? You know, Steve Michael Michael said in the in the podcast um, that this whole thing it's like it's like picking at a strand like a strand mm-hmm. in a carpet, you know, or a mm-hmm. rug, and you know when you pick at one. Everything yeah. else begins to unravel, and I think that's what's that's been the story of of our journey, yours and mine, yeah. um, is that we've just we we pick at one thing that seems loose, and when we do, right. we find that there's another and another. And yeah. when you start asking the kinds of questions that you and I have been asking for the last this is our this is our fifth year now doing this, Steve. Wow. I can't can you believe that? <laughs> no. But when you ask the kinds right, of questions in 2008, my goodness. that you and I have been asking for the last five years, just mm-hmm. and, and even before that, before the podcast, yeah, uh, you eventually just find that so much of what you've embraced is really just an airtight dogmatic system that's yeah. been created to insulate you from from questions. Right. You know, that it's been used to insulate you and make you feel secure and make you feel safe because yep. somehow we think that an airtight theology or, you know, if we can sew all the answers up and dot all our, our I's and cross all our T's, that somehow that's going to make us safer with God. But when we realize that God loves us unconditionally and that whatever the junk is we have in our lives, that his, his aim is to get it out of us mm-hmm. by any means necessary and that he's going to do that, yeah. that somehow he's going to purify us. When mm-hmm. we get that, it becomes a lot. This journey of questioning becomes part of our growth and it becomes a free oh, process yeah. instead of this scary, you know, fall, feel, fear of falling away. Yeah, boy, that's and, and, you know, for you and me both, it kind of started in that uh, the the journey for both of us individually began with that fear of falling away. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, there was. I know you and I have talked uh, before. I, I'm sure we've talked about it on the podcast in years past, but I know you and I have talked personally too. Uh, you especially had some some feelings of, you know, God, am I totally going way off the deep end with yeah, this? Yeah. And and I had the same thoughts. And and it's um, what what I have learned, Ray, over the last uh, at least decade, I guess, that I've been walking on this particular journey. What I've learned is that questioning is not a sign of falling away it's really a sign of getting closer you know Mm -hmm. and and i don't mean questioning in the sense of of doubting everything but or questioning questioning, just for questioning's sake we're not talking about yeah exactly yeah it's it's not a, a, a you know just a futile exercise but it really is um allowing myself the freedom to say what if i'm wrong about this and like for me, with regard to the, the topic of Satan, and, and I think you guys kind of t- hit on this a little bit, um, I, I began to question, what is this backstory that we have? Mm. And where does it really come from? Because I had always been taught, you know, Satan was a created being that, you know, he was an angel and he was the highest ranking angel and had this, you know, the closest position to God and he rebelled and he fell. 
And and I've come to realize, uh, like with so many other topics, when I actually go back and read the scripture for myself, I go, wait a minute, it doesn't say that. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. I mean, there, there's so much that we, we've created this whole, what I keep calling the backstory about Satan in order to believe certain things about him and or to make certain passages of scripture make sense or whatever. And I'm I'm at the point right now, and I'm not settled at all on this issue. I don't know what the answers are yet, but I'm at the point where, you know, this kind of roundtable discussion is exciting for me because I want to think it through fresh, and I want to come at it with a fresh mind and go, okay, what if he's not even a personal being? What if he wasn't a created being? It doesn't make sense that he's a created being who rebels and rebels for eternity when you and I now believe in ultimate reconciliation of everything else that was created, you know? Uh, so they're all, it, it's just a great topic to, to discuss, and I hope we can continue to discuss it. So anyway, all that to say, Ray, that I, I, I just feel like it's a great conversation for us to be having. And I think that, uh, that this roundtable that you've had with Michael and Brad is, is a great way to move that conversation forward even more. And uh, I look forward to seeing what comes out of it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I- I'm looking forward to hearing what you guys out there have to say. <laughs> hook us, <laughs> hook up with us on our website, beyondtheboxpodcast.com. You can leave comments there, but probably the best place to do so, if you're on Facebook, go to facebook.com slash beyondthebox. Um, th- this conversation is absolutely wonderful that we want you to contribute to, but any conversation you see going on on Facebook, feel free to join in there. Um, feel free to start your own conversation and, and see who wants to jump in there. We're all, we yeah. always have people that you know are just kind of putting their thoughts out there or maybe something that they're thinking about that they've not quite got settled that they want to get some other input on. So we would love for you to do that. You can also visit us on Twitter. How about that, Steve? Yeah, twitter.com slash BTB podcast. And uh, last but definitely not least... You can visit <laughs> beyondtheboxpodcast.com, and there's a Call Me widget on the side, on the right-hand side. You can click that Call Me widget, type your name and phone number, and submit, and our answering service will call you back and let you leave a message with your comment, your idea submission, your disagreement, your snarky remark, whatever you want to put on there. <laughs> or you can call the phone number yourself by dialing 626-24-NO-BOX. That's 626 246 Six two six nine. However you connect with us, we just want you to do so, and we thank you for taking the time to stick us in your ears, to jump on Facebook and get in the Absolutely. conversation. We consider it a privilege to have you guys as part of our community. Thank you guys so much for listening. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time on Beyond the Box.